Okay, so today we're going to continue our series talking about ethics and the middle way. Um, and we've talked about, uh, in the last couple of sessions, we've talked about um, virtues and about um, consequences as ways of approaching ethics, you know, ways of thinking about ethics. And um, if you remember, we talked about uh, how either of those approaches might be helpful in some ways. Uh, you can use them provisionally in a middle way approach, uh, but using them absolutely is problematic. So the same thing as you'll probably guess is like to apply to rules. Um, the rules are the most basic way probably that you'll, you'll probably think of first when we talk about ethics, we tend to think about moral rules uh, because that's what we encounter first of all in childhood. So we get set rules by our parents and you can see that as a, as a means of socialization. So we, so we get used to meeting certain standards by following rules. Uh, so it's both a social and a moral means of, of control and development. Um, so by rules, uh, there's a whole spread of different levels at which rules could operate. Um, so obviously the most the widest level is, is law. Uh, so we're beginning to get a little bit into the politics here by mentioning law even. Um, so national and international law. Um, but you can also talk about rule, ethical rules, making a universal claim uh, that come from an authoritative source of some kind. So, for example, the Ten Commandments uh, you probably have come across as, as um, you know, a claimed set of universal rules. That, that the, uh, when those were uh, put forward in religious contexts, particularly Christianity, you know, they're seen as rules that everybody ought to follow, uh, which define uh, what's good in that tradition. So that's what's known as deontological ethics. That is the idea that um, we can tell what's right or wrong just by consulting a set of rules. That's obviously going to be, uh, you know, a, an idea we need to examine carefully rather than just accept. Um, so, so there's ethical rules. There's there's social rules which are often un, unwritten, like um, don't pick your nose in public. You know, sort of ways that uh, people expect others to behave. There are rules of specific organisations, like rules in schools or workplaces. And then finally, but not least, I think the rules that we set ourselves, so like New Year's resolutions, for example, or precepts. Um, so rules could also just be something that you never tell anybody else about, but at one point you decide you want to follow this rule. And that's a way of uh, structuring or testing your own responses to things. Um, so by rules, we could mean anything along you know, that, that whole spectrum from international law right down to individual rules or precepts. Um, now, um, rules usually come from some sort of authoritative source, whether it's a, a government or a parent or even a, a better self, if you like. So the self that decides to make the resolution uh, for your other self later on to follow. Um, Obviously, in many cases, it's enforced using using power, but not always. Um, and rules have various obvious disadvantages. So, so they're often clumsy and inflexible. Uh, they're one size fits all um, because the rule makers can't predict every complex situation where their rule might be applied when they make that rule. Um, so we had a recent example of that in UK politics. Um, I think in the uh, difficulties faced by uh, certain people from the Windrush, Windrush generation of immigrants from uh, West Indies who were uh, caught up in a bureaucratic net as supposed undocumented migrants, even though some of them had been in the country for 40 years and were well embedded in British society. So I expect in that sort of example, the bureaucrats didn't want necessarily to catch those people with the net, but nevertheless, their rules were not flexible enough to take into account the particular situation of those people uh, to be just to them. So, so you can probably think of other examples you know, where, where rules 
are clumsy and inflexible and you know, they don't take into account everybody's needs. Um, they also depend on a culture of compliance quite often. Um, so for rules to work, people generally have to respect them and obey them. And, and once a few people start not doing, then rapidly the rules start to unravel. Um, so if you think about uh, motorway driving, that's an obvious example close to me. Um, so on UK motorways, there's a 70 mile an hour speed limit, but probably everyone's experience of driving along the motorway at 70 miles an hour, say, is that you'll very frequently be overtaken by people going faster than that. Um, so that um, every time we're overtaken in that way, we get a signal, oh, actually, the rule doesn't matter that much, or it's not that strictly adhered to, and therefore the rule begins to break down. Uh, so it doesn't just depend on what the official rule is. It's, it's uh, the compliance that makes the rule in practice, um, or, or destroys it, of course. Um, and rules are always subject to issues of interpretation because they're made of words, uh, words that we interpret through our embodied experience. So they're inevitably ambiguous and vague. They're never going to entirely nail down exactly uh, how to behave or why. Um, and um, rules are absolute in the sense that either you comply with the rule or you don't. Uh, so at least officially, in most cases, half compliance is non-compliance. You know, if you uh, if you drive at 71 miles an hour on the motorway, you're still not complying with the law, at least officially, whether or not the police actually turn a blind eye in practice. So um, those are obviously features of rules that might strike us immediately as problematic. But it doesn't necessarily mean that rules are always useless, morally speaking. Um, but it's where rules are interpreted absolutely that I think, for, you know, in terms of the middle way, we're trying to find the way between a positive and a negative absolute in each each case. Yeah. So, so where a rule is concerned, it's interpreting the rule absolutely and taking it to be necessarily always right as stated. Uh, that's problematic. Um, so, if you interpret a rule absolutely. There's no allowance for errors, no allowance for ambiguity or vagueness, no allowance for the fact that it's going to be interpreted differently in different situations. Um, so that has various further effects uh, if you interpret rules absolutely, but uh, it undermines responsibility, I think. So, um, yeah, those who uh, interpret rules absolutely, if you think of, uh, say, Islamic State or something like that, with a group that has a very strong set of absolute rules, um, then there's generally no recognition that we have to interpret those rules and take responsibility for interpreting. Um, and um, one of my favorite philosophers from this point of view is, is um, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, who used the example of what he called the anguish of Abraham. Um, so you may know the story of Abraham from the Old Testament where he was commanded by God to sacrifice his son. Um, and he was all ready to do that uh, when an angel intervened at the last minute and told him not to, to sacrifice a goat instead. But um, Sartre points out in relation to that example that Abraham was still responsible for interpreting what he was told and for uh, deciding effectively that this really was God's command and this really was an absolute responsibility that he had to do. Um, so in a way he couldn't get out of that responsibility. If he was going to do this thing to sacrifice his son, he was still responsible for deciding that the source of authority was real and that it really commanded him to do that and that he ought to do it. You know, it's still the book passed to him. Uh, and so I think that's a good way of kind of encapsulating the situation wherever you've got uh, an authoritarian who denies their own responsibility for following the rules, they say, we're just following the rules, Gov. Uh, actually, Sartre points out they are responsible for their, for their interpretation of that rule. And if you take the rule absolutely, effectively, you're passing the buck 
Uh, absolute rules also encourage legalism. So endless, in, endless technicality, uh, getting caught up in the words of the rules, creating hedge rules about when you should follow the rule, when you shouldn't, casuistry, you know, how to cope with specific cases and whether they follow it or don't. Um, so all that kind of thing, again, you can probably think of examples, tends to increase conflicts, may undermine the justice that the rule was meant, uh, originally intended to have. Um, and you probably also think of rules as tools of power for, for leaders or for groups. Um, so sometimes rules can just be used actually as tests of loyalty uh, to show that you've adopted the values of the group. Um, so if you think of the ancient Jewish dietary laws uh, in the book of Leviticus, for example, um, as I understand the point of those, like you know, don't eat dairy products with meat, uh, this was just about identity, you know, showing you were a member of that tribe, a loyal member of that tribe and not another tribe. So if another tribe eats meat with milk, you don't do that, uh, is, the, is the command, and that shows that you're a loyal member of the, the Israelite tribe and not another tribe. Uh, and so rules can continue to be used in that way, just as tests of loyalty to this day. Uh, and of course, if you've got a compliant culture, uh, that can create more and more controlling rules and could spiral. So, so now George Orwell's novel, 1984, gives a scenario of more and more restrictive rules and more and more restrictive environment, which creates more compliance, which creates more rules and so on. <clears throat> so all of that can, yeah, it can lead us, suck us into a nightmare idea of what rules can do. But that doesn't necessarily mean that rules are just tools of absolutization or that they were always absolute. Um, so let's look more at the positive side of rules and how we can use them helpfully. Um, <clears throat> so whether a rule is absolute really is determined by its framing. So when we look in a bigger context, what's the meaning of that rule intended to be? How is it interpreted? So if you contextualize a rule, not as being always necessarily right, uh, but as dependent on the circumstances, if we interpret it conditionally or practically, or we just focus on the meaning of the rule rather than believing in it absolutely, uh, then you can give it a frame which makes it more helpful. Uh, so conditionality will be one of those approaches. If you, if you follow the rule as if, or follow the rule in terms of one possible model. You realize it's one possible way of doing things. It's not the only way, but it's a useful way for now. Uh, so many rules in particular, um, institutions, for example, work in that way. Uh, so I used to work as a teacher in a sixth form college, for example. And one of the things that I appreciated about the way rules worked in that context compared to a school is that the students were there voluntarily, at least in theory. So if there was a problem, you could say to them, well, um, do you want to get your A-levels? You know, what, why did you come to the college? If you want to be successful here, then you will need to do this rather than just just do this. Um, so so there, was a, there was a conditionality about them being there, which made the rules make more sense, really. It gave them a purpose and a context. So you could say the same about rules that you adopt for a particular goal, for a particular practice, say, the rules of good meditation, the rules of good carpentry. Um, or you could have rules that you just experiment with uh, in the imagination, you know, rules that you might have in utopia without actually um, expecting to follow them. So rules can be helpful in all sorts of ways. Um, and perhaps one of the major ways is that they can offer a test of consistency. Um, and the philosopher uh, Immanuel Kant, who uh, was responsible for Kantian ethics, uh, one of the major ways of thinking about ethics, uh, particularly, I think, had this helpful point to make. Um, so he thought of helpful ethics as ethics that required us to be consistent and to more vigorously think about whether we were being consistent with what we set out to do or whether we were kind of making exceptions of ourselves. 
Um, so if you think about something like leaving litter, uh, why is it a bad idea? Why is it wrong to leave litter? Because um, they, well, I'm just going to leave this napper on the ground here. This isn't going to make much difference to anybody. Why should I worry about that? Um, so the consequences of doing that are pretty small. But Kant would say, yeah, if you do that, you make an exception of yourself. What if everybody else did it? Um, and even though everybody else isn't doing it, um, you're relying on them not doing so. You're freeloading. Um, so not making an exception of yourself uh, gives one way of stretching ourselves and, and um, examining whether we're trying to uh, face up to conditions better. So rules can prompt us to do that. So a rule like not leaving litter uh, can prompt us to examine whether or not we are trying to be consistent. Um, and maybe that's how rules can operate helpfully when we're growing up. Uh, they provide consistency and expectations. You know, so so uh, psychologists talk about the, uh, the value, obviously, of consistent parenting, uh, laying down rules, providing a structure. Um, but that seemed to apply to us later as well. You know, if we can provide some sort of structure for ourselves um, or for others, that can often be helpful. So um, that can also obviously apply to personal precepts. So they can provide you with an ethical stretch in that way. Uh, so if you set out, if you make a New Year's resolution to meditate every day, for example, um, then you can check yourself against that. You can look at it again in two weeks, ask yourself, have I done that? Um, okay. Um, and then we, I talked earlier about you know, rules often being uh, inflexible, but rules can be adaptable to some extent. Um, if they're interpreted provisionally, if people recognize that rules have reasons behind them, and they understand the framing and the reasons for the rule and agree about it, then it's possible to, um, to change rules so that they adapt reasonably well. Um, but obviously, one of the reasons, one of the difficulties, for example, recently in the, the COVID regulations that keep changing, is that uh, the reasons for the changes were complex and debatable. So uh, perhaps uh, a lot of non-compliance is to do with the fact that people didn't really understand always the reasons for the changes. Um, generally, I think it's it's better to try and change a rule than to bend it or break it. Um, that's my attitude anyway. So, so perhaps sometimes when I've worked in places that have silly rules, um, I've tried to get into dialogue with the authority that produced the rules, the boss say, uh, rather than just undermining the rule. Uh, that at least creates a, a longer term solution if you can manage it. Uh, and that's, of course, the advantage of democracy as well, that, that uh, democracy hopefully can help us to, to change the law when it needs changing. But the provisionality of the rules we use depends really on the general integration of the people involved. So it's easier to do with people who've got it together a bit. It's easier with adults and with children, for example, um, to uh, adapt rules in an appropriate way to meet the circumstances. Um, and the, the other forms of ethical thinking that we've looked at, uh, so virtues and consequences, can give us levers for reviewing rules and uh, reviewing how we treat rules. Um, so if we think about the consequences of the rules, that can give us another perspective to uh, look at the rule. So if we look at um, <clears throat> laws, uh, laws banning recreational drugs, for example, one of the questions you might want to ask is, have they worked? Have they produced the kinds of um, effects that they were hoping to produce? Uh, personally, I think the answer to that is largely no. <laughs> um, so that's a reason, I think, for reviewing uh, drug laws. Anyway, um, so, so the idea of provisional rules, treating rules provisionally, is not the same as anarchy or antinomianism. Antinomianism is sort of the, the belief that we shouldn't have any rules. Um, it's it's um, the idea really that, that um, 
rules should have a function and we should be aware of that function. Um, and if we're, if we're following the rules, if we're in a context where we follow those rules, then yeah, we should generally follow them. Um, but they should also be open to the examination. So, so rules do have a realistic place, I think, in ethics and politics, and, uh, but following the middle way has some implications for how we treat rules. So just to try and summarize those finally, I'd say not absolutizing rules. So trying to be aware of the limitations of the rules. Um, uh, considering that rules are needed for practical purposes, whether that's sort of creating a basic order, like in a classroom, for example, or stretching ourselves uh, from where we start. Um, contextualizing the rules. So asking why we have the rule, what it's for, um, and using recognised mechanisms where possible for, for changing rules rather than just breaking them. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Um, and uh, open to questions and comments then. Hang on, we'll Get back with any points. I sometimes have difficulty with the word rule itself. It, 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 it um, for me, often implies um, absolute, you know, something that's absolute. Uh, um, I, I, I prefer the term guidelines often in many situations because that, that has the more of a feel of provisionality. Obviously, you know, in a, a school or somewhere like that, you know, maybe if you used guideline, that would maybe a bit too flexible, you know, uh, but uh, in many situations, perhaps would be more appropriate. And, and I think the in the in the Buddhist tradition, the, the the use of the term precepts has that feeling of provisionality more than more than the word rule. Mm. Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? I, I mean, I can see the the point of using the term guideline where there is that flexibility, and everyone is conscious of it and can cope with it. Um, but there are also situations where you want to make it clear that you expect everyone to bear the rules yeah. the vast majority of the time, <laughs> um, where guideline might just be a bit too floppy. Um, but um, with regards to the term precept, though, um, I think that's interesting in, in that um, that's certainly the way I've often heard the term precept interpreted in Western Buddhist context, that, that a precept is something you take on for yourself on your own responsibility. And, and I think that's a really helpful idea. Um, <clears throat> but my experience in, in Asia of the way the five precepts in Buddhism are interpreted, for example, is that they seem to be treated very much just like rules. Um, you know, so they're a Buddhist version of the, the Ten Commandments. Um, and that they have very kind of fixed interpretations. Um, so so what so what sexual misconduct means, you know, just means no rape and no rape, no rape, no adultery and so on, rather than having a more um, nuanced interpretation. Yeah, just one other thing as well. I mean, I often think that one of the biggest compliments you can pay someone in our culture is to call them principled. Um, you know, and that that implies that it's someone who who is very rule based. But uh, yeah, that that could be problematic too. I mean, um, um, do you, do you think that 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 uh, reflects something about our particular culture that we, we praise that term so highly? I think there's a positive aspect to that. Um, that if you think of the, the Kantian approach that, that setting yourself a rule is a good way of introducing consistency and some sort of discipline into what you're doing, um, then somebody who's principled has that kind of discipline, you could say. You expect consistency from them. Yeah. Um, not necessarily rigid consistency, but reasonable consistency, um, and that that will be only uh, you know one of the problems with Trump, for example. You know, Trump seems to have no principles whatsoever. <laughs> um, 
and um, he acts very inconsistently. Yeah. Um, and that's a problem, isn't it? It's obviously a problem. Um, so uh, it's, that tells us something positive, I think, about um, yeah, principles as sort of thought out general rules. Thank you. Any other thoughts or questions? Could we say um, principles are concerned more with um, adopting a rule consciously or adopting a principle consciously, whereas rules could be followed by uh, automatons? Um, even if you're talking about moral rules like the Ten Commandments, you could kind of follow them automatically without thinking. But a principle and the idea of the Buddhist precepts was that you would hopefully take them on board consciously and apply them consciously. Yeah, I mean, that, that might be a useful distinction to make, whether people always use them in that way is a different matter. But, um, but yeah, obviously the, the term rule is used in logic, isn't it? And, and IT programming and, and so on. So, so yeah, there are, there are other sort of mechanistic ways of using the word rule. Julian? Am I right in thinking that in the Buddhist tradition there's something about um, you know when you the sort of progress towards enlightenment and, and there's a kind of stage you go oh, it's stream entry or something higher like an arhant or something but when you you become free of rules and precepts or something like that um, what's what's that about or what do you what do you understand that as about what, what's that, that what does that mean. Uh, I think there's a quite a fraught and disputed area <laughs> from my understanding of it. Um, so there's, there's a whole stuff about skillful means um, and the idea that uh, at a certain advanced level a bodhisattva can, uh, in the Mahayana tradition, can break the rules because they're kind of guaranteed by their level of virtue to have got beyond needing to obey rules. Um, there is a more basic level in the uh, ten precepts, isn't there, where dependence on rites and rituals is regarded as as a fitter. So you're you're you've become emotionally dependent on certain rituals as as rules, which is a is not a good thing. Yeah, I mean that's one very that, positive thing that, that I think we find in the Buddhist tradition that, that there's a recognition of the limits of rules um, that seems much more rarely found in. Well, particularly in Islam, say, which very much depends on legalism as a basis of ethics. Um, and in Christianity, it's often legalistic as well. Any other thoughts? Andy. Yeah, I've been, while you've been talking, I've been thinking sort of along the lines, I suppose, of cognitive psychology and the notion that humans want to, um, I said we all want to find rules um, in the sense of move away from um, disparate experience into a kind of uh, unified experience, into a set of principles by which things operate, just in terms of perception. But, but that sort of goes a little further in that then um, the kind of moral and ethical dimension is a lot, is a lot easier for humans to make sense of given that there may be some rules which define what's good, what's bad, um, and what's in between. So maybe it's a kind of, um, you know, we, it's not that the rules are imposed by authority from above, but we actually consciously seek these, this kind of rule governing behavior. Um, and we want um, some set of principles by which to operate. And the kind of converse of that, the, the, the spin-off of that is that then, then we sometimes miss the, the diversity of situation, um, problem, framing, context, whatever you want to call it. So that we, because we seek a notion of simplification of experience, we sometimes miss out on experience because we seek this simplification of what's right and wrong. We therefore miss out on the fact that um, there are too many factors involved to make such simplistic and absolutist judgments. Oh. Right, that was a bit complicated. Yeah, yeah, good point. I don't think I've got much to, to add to that, really. Um, any other comments? <laughs> <laughs>
I was just thinking that um, it appeared to be like a hierarchy um, of moving from a very structured, childlike, obeying a rule, an absolute, to a wisdom tradition where it broadens out, where our decision making is much more fluid. If you look at Christ, he was constantly challenging the small mindedness of. Well, you say this, but I say that. If you say we should not work on the Sabbath, then I say we should. Mm. It's the first one who hasn't sinned cast the first stone. And he's constantly troubling the waters of absolute rules. Mm. And um, so my mind is going, and what everyone was saying is that we nearly move uh, in a hierarchy to broaden out towards wisdom. But that's very dangerous for children to do that because they may not have the experience of it. Yeah, the, the, there's some um, interesting relationships there on the two, two levels of psychological development that, that have been charted by um, various uh, moral psychologists you know, who, have, who have tried to, um, you know, Piagetians and Kohlberg and people like that who have, who have tried to um, work out how children develop at different levels. Um, and certainly I've been very influenced by um, what's the book here actually? Uh, Ke Robert Keegan, The Evolving Self. Um, so uh, he, he extends uh, Jean Piaget's uh, analysis of psychological levels for children into adulthood. Um, so that helps to make sense, I think, of different uh, moral stages that we, that we uh, arrive at and, and how uh, the rules are obviously more restricted uh, and interpreted more absolutely at a, a basic level, but, but um, we get gradually more aware of the, of the context, the context opens out, if you like, as we, as we move on, as we develop. Um, and uh, so particularly in, in Keegan's scheme in adulthood with the, the, um, is what he calls stage three, which uh, is where we, we take our departure point for rules as other people. So, so that's perhaps a, a very typical sort of adolescent um, approach to understanding the rules that should govern our lives is that we, we uh, imitate what our peers are, are doing and take that as the point of departure. Um, but then stage four is where you might start rationalizing it all. You might have an, adopt an ideology, you might adopt a, uh, an absolute sort of source of morality, or you might have a be part of a scientific or professional culture where there are fairly clear rules, but they're rules which have been rationalized and they're, they plan to be universal. Um, so there you've got a bigger context for your rules, if you like. But then the, the fifth stage is where we try and get beyond the limitations of that. So, so if you can uh, recognize the limitations of ideologies um, and recognize that they can't always pin down exactly what's right and wrong in every circumstance, um, you know, that, which is basically what we're trying to do in the Middle West society, <laughs> then I think you're, you're, you're moving into what Keegan described as the, the fifth stage. It's um, nearly like an attitude of, it becomes an adverb, is it, rather than a thing. So, talking this morning in Quakers on hope, if you pin your hope on something, or you are hopeful, it, it, it creates a very different way of teasing out, they're broadening out. Mm. Maybe that's also could be true on um, rules, to be rule bound or to be, what was the word others used to be principled? Yeah. Yeah, you could, you could think of being principled as having some sort of ideological basis for judging things. Um, but uh, you can still be sort of limited by principles, depending on how you interpret them. Great, okay, well, I think we'd better uh, stop there, so I'll stop the recording.